We're going to look at our first method for estimating activity coefficients, the debye huckel limiting law. And the reason for this is that for ionic compounds, for, for electrolytes, there's going to be a significant departure from ideal behavior, even at fairly low concentrations. Let's try to explain why. Let's imagine we have two ions, and I'll just mark them as a, a positive and negative ion. So these, I'm marking them because those are our two test charges that we're going to be paying attention to. Now we know there's a force of attraction between those two ions. And that force is reduced somewhat if we, if we put water in here. This water has a dielectric strength that is going to be uh, uh, greater than 1. It's around 78 at room temperature. And so we could say, if we write Coulomb's law, we could say the energy of attraction depends on the two charges divided by the distance. So the potential energy is equal to this. And then there's a set of constants. 4 pi epsilon naught, and that is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th. And you can see that this is going to give us an attractive potential. And so we could say that if we, if we graph potential energy versus distance, we can see that for our case, Q1 and, ooh, it's supposed to be Q1 and Q2, those are opposite charges, so one of them's negative, and so we end up with a negative potential energy. So the curve looks something like this, and then it just keeps going down as we get closer and closer together. So that would be an attractive potential. The only problem with Coulomb's law, as I've written it here, is that it's only true in a vacuum. Okay, if we put water in here, then the energy is going to look a little bit different, the energy expression. The energy of attraction is still Q1, Q2, or R, so it's still proportional to, the, to each charge and to inversely proportional to the distance. And we still have 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, just our, our constants. But there's another constant we have to throw on there, the relative dielectric strength. So we'll just write the dielectric constant. And uh, we, this is pretty easy to understand. We know we have field lines going out from any positive charge, so we could draw the field lines like that. And we could say that the positive charge attracts the negative charge, or we could say that this electric field, would, we know we would, it would push a positive charge to the right, it would pull in a negative charge. Those are equivalent ways of looking at this. Well, what happens if we put water in here? Well, water's got a dipole moment, and so we know it's going to line itself up. So I'll simplify water by just drawing it just as the dipole that it is. So we know it's going to line up. It's going to tumble, but on average, it's going to be pointed in this orientation more than in the opposite orientation, right? And so the, the, uh, this is just an abbreviation, right? If we were to draw it, we draw it something like, something like this, right? That we've got the oxygen pointing towards the positive charge and the hydrogen's pointing away but we can just as well represent that as this, as this dipole over here. All right, now what's the electric field set up with that dipole? Let's go ahead and draw another dipole so I can do it a little more neatly. The dipole has field lines going from the positive charge towards the negative one. So notice what happens here. The field lines set up by the dipole are going to decrease the field strength between this positive and negative charge. They're basically the water is the dielectric constant of the water essentially shields the two charges from each other and decreases their attraction. And let me just mention here that at room temperature, the dielectric constant for water, um, this is right that we're talking about water here, is around 78.5. Okay, it's actually a pretty strong function of temperature. As water gets less dense with uh, temperature, the dielectric constant goes down. The point is. Two charges in water attract each other almost 80 times more weakly than two charges in a vacuum. Okay, so uh, the lesson one is that attraction between charges uh, is, is lessened when we put something in a polar solvent. It's part of the reasons why salts dissolve in water is that they, they, uh, the cations and the anions aren't attracted as strongly to each other, and so they're able to, to separate with them in a polar solvent. Okay. 
Now, what does this have to do with the bihocal limiting law? Well, we already said that if we have a, a test charge that is positive and negative, that their attractions decrease by the solvent. All right, well, that's a given. And we can sort of wrap that effect into the standard state. Okay, we can say, okay, the standard state would be a cation or an anion dissolved in water, and we're already accounting for the effect of the water. But what happens if I put additional electrolyte? Let's imagine that we add not just pure water, but let's put in some sodium chloride and see what happens to that when it dissolves. Well, we know the sodium ions and the chloride ions are going to dissociate from another in water and, and uh, be distributed in the water. Now, let's imagine we have two charges. And for clarity, let's, let's not make them sodium and chloride. Maybe let's have this be, maybe this might be, uh, let's go ahead and label it. Let's just say that it's an aluminum. And let's say that this is, uh, uh, I don't know, let's, uh, let's make it a phosphate. I don't know. I'm not feeling very creative right now. Let's make it a phosphate. Okay. So what's going to happen? Um, now aluminum phosphate is not very soluble. So imagine we have a very, we're going to have a very low concentration of aluminum phosphate. Okay. Now what's going to happen when we put in the sodium chloride? Well, we know that the sodium and the chlorides are distributed randomly in the solution, but not near these ions, right? This is a big negative charge. So we're going to have a sort of excess of sodium over here in this region, and, and, and not so many of the chlorides. And over in this region, we're going to have you know, a, an excess of, of chlorides and not so, many, not so many sodiums. In the middle, we'd expect that it's just as likely to, to see a sodium as a chloride. They're, they're, they're just sort of distributed randomly at that point, right? OK. So what does that mean? If we look at this cloud of charges here, we can say we've got this big cloud of, of more positive than negative and more negative than positive. And what kind of field is that going to set up? That's going to set up a field in this direction. So that's caused by the electrolyte, the added electrolyte. Okay. If we look at the field for our original test charges, it's going this way. So we can see that they're in opposition. The field set up by the electrolyte is subtracting from the original field. So what's that going to do to the attraction between this charge and this charge? What's it going to do? It's going to weaken it. So we're going to say that the electrolyte is going to do some more screening. And so this means those two charges, they're attracted to each other less in a salty solution than they are in water. Okay. And so if we think about this, the influence they exert on one another is lessened, it's as if their concentration is lower. And so what we can say is the activity of the, uh, the big negative charge is less than the activity, um, let's say, I say in, um, in brine, I'll put it that way, in brine should be less than the activity in pure water. So it looks like just putting in some electrolyte is going to change the activities of all the other ions in solution.